your fire fall, let your fire fall. Hope in the heavens, pour your spirit up on us. Unleash your presence, Jesus come alive in us. Hope in the heavens, oh, this time. This time, this place, it's yours. Unlock the gates and open up the doors. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done. Let your fire fall. Sing it out, your word. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. And your way is the only way for me. It's a narrow road that leads to life. I want to be on it. Sing it out. I'll take you at your word. If you said it, I'll believe it. I've seen how good it works. If you start it. The chaos fell in light, and I know, cause I've seen it in my life, it's a narrow road that needs to life, I want to be on it, it's a narrow road, and the tide is high, but you part at the water. I'll take you at your word. If you said it, I'll believe it. Cause I've seen how good it works. If you start it, you'll complete it. I'll take you at your word. If you said Sing it 
now. You said your love. And you said your love will never give up. And you said your grace is always enough. And you said your heart will never forget or forsake me. And you said I'm saved. And you call me yours. And you said my future's full of your hope. And you've never failed, so I know that you'll never fail me. Come on, let's sing that out. And you said your love will never give up. And you said your grace is always enough. And you said your heart will never forget or forsake me. And you said I'm saved, you call me yours. You said my future's full of your hope, and you've never failed. So I know that you'll never fail me. I'll take you at your word. If you said it, I'll believe it, because I've seen how good it works. If you started, you'll complete it. I'll take you at your word. If you said it, I'll believe it. Because I've seen how good it works. If you started, you'll complete it. I'll take you at your word. Because you're good on your promise. You're good on your promise. Take you at your word. Yes, Father, we take you at your word. We stand on what you say, Lord. Even when we can't see it, even if we don't feel it, we stand on what you say and what you say about us. You are so good to me. So faithful. Come on, help me sing. I call you faithful for the promises you kept and every need you met. Lord, I'm 
together today to sing your praises, to worship your wonderful name, Jesus. Come on, sing with me. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Come on, let's sing it together. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name Would you lift your voice and worship to him this morning? Oh, Jesus, there's no one like you, none beside you. Come on, just in your own words, begin to open up your mouth and worship.
God. All right, Crossing Church, let's praise him. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 The name that is above every name. That at his name, at his name, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. And we have the privilege, the honor, the blessing of being in his family. So if you are excited about the family that you're a part of, Let's praise his name again. Come on. Yes. All right. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Praise. Yes. Well, if we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Reggie, and I'm the pastor of hugs here at the crossing. So I'm hoping that uh, before you leave today, I get a chance to hug your neck. And so before we go to video announcements, I'd like you to do a 360 spin, and everybody you see, tell them they look good, they smell good, and you're glad that they're here. Get everybody, all right? Welcome to The Crossing. We are so glad that you're here. I'm Andrew. And I'm Christian. And here are your video announcements. If you're a first time guest, we would love to personally connect with you. Check out the connect card in the seat back pocket in front of you. Fill out this card and drop it off at the connect desk in the lobby after service. If you're joining us online, you can fill out the same connect card at thecrossing.cc slash connect. We'll reach out to you this week to help you find the best community for you. And speaking of community, today is Life Group Launch Sunday. At The Crossing, we believe life is meant to be lived in a local biblical community. So joining the Life Group is a great way to connect with others, grow in your faith, and experience the power of community. Finding a life group is easy. Following the service, you can meet with our life group leaders outside at the Breezeway. They'll happily answer any questions and help you connect to a group. And if you are joining us in person, take the life group stamp card that can be found at any of our leaders' tables. Have five different leaders initial it and drop it off at the round tables to enter in a drawing for a chance to win a gift card. A gift card? A gift card. And if you're joining us online, head to thecrossing.cc slash groups to find all of the life groups meeting this semester. Men, join us for our first men's breakfast of the year this Saturday, February 24th at 9 a.m. in the main auditorium. You'll enjoy a delicious breakfast and engage in meaningful fellowship with like-minded men who strive to fulfill their God-given potential. Bring your fathers, sons, cousins, uncles, and register for this amazing fellowship at thecrossing.cc slash men. We look, we look forward, forward to seeing you there. there. To stay up to date on everything that's going on here at The Crossing, you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, or download our Church Center app. Well, that's all that we have for you this morning. So let's stand to our feet and please help me welcome our senior pastor, Pastor Randy. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Praise God. You guys can have a seat. That's fantastic. I appreciate y'all doing that. That's totally not necessary, but it is sweet. So appreciate you guys. Good morning to you and good morning to everybody that's joining us online. We're happy you're here. I do want to introduce a, a friend of mine, Pastor Glenn King. My dear friend here is here with us. And if I get in trouble and uh, we got to pull in a, you know, substitute, uh, Glenn's going to finish the message for us here. So we, we're so appreciative to Pastor Glenn, our sweet new friend, Teresa, too. Can we honor Teresa as well, man? Yes. Precious Teresa there. Great. Well, gang, we've just gotten through uh, 37 days of our time of prayer. Those of you that are new with us. Uh, we've gone through uh, the whole, not the whole book of Daniel, but chapters 1 through 6 of the book of Daniel. 
And uh, we've got left now 7 through 12, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. I do want to just say, fellas, next Saturday, it's actually not a 9 o'clock start, it's an 8 o'clock start for that breakfast. 8 o'clock start next Saturday for our men's breakfast. And let me also remind you, if you're new with us, next steps is the way that we invite you in. If you're wondering about the church, if you'd like to get more involved in the church, or you just got questions, next steps happens after the second service next week, all right? Serving, serving uh, steak, lobster, and all kinds of fancy stuff. Either that or sandwiches. I don't know which Sunday it is. But y'all come, and we're going we're gonna to take care of y'all for lunch. But gang, uh, y'all actually open your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 8. This will be the first time I don't say open to, to Daniel. So, gang, hear me. Um, th- while y'all are headed over there, let me tell you why we're headed over there. So, Daniel 1 through 6 is the history. Daniel 7 through 12 are all the visions of the, the end times things. Let me run you through those very quickly. Daniel sees 483 years of future visions. The Medo-Persian Empire, the uh, Greek Empire. He sees Alexander the Great. He sees uh, the Roman Empire. He sees Jesus coming into the Roman Empire. Uh, there's a lot of complex uh, allegory used in those chapters that very much marry to the book of Revelation. If, if we start trying to go through all 70 weeks and trying to un- unpack all of that, my concern is that we would bog down. Let, let me, I'm, this is almost terrible of me. I will give you a message on it someday. But we talk about the end times quite a bit actually around here. And so uh, I, I, I actually want to get to, I kind of want to get to the next thing. So let me give you some references. If you want to study in detail the 70 weeks, uh, if you want to do it in high detail, Dr. Chuck Missler's book, Daniel's 70 Weeks. Take a picture of that. Uh, Dr. Uh, Missler also, he's no longer with us, but he's a brilliant teacher. He teaches free on the Internet all the books of Daniel, and he will get you so in the weeds. If, you, if you're a person that likes to get in the weeds, dive in. Uh, the next one down would be Dr. David Jeremiah. I don't mean down. I just mean more simple than Chuck. A little simpler read on the book of Daniel, the handwriting on the wall. That would be a great reference for you. So if you want to get into the weeds a little less, the next one up, if you want it real simple, I'm talking cookies on the bottom shelf type thinking, Pastor Chris Hodges, The Daniel Dilemma, it's so conversational. Uh, so I'm just, I'm, I'm going down in how difficult they are. The last thing I would recommend would be uh, Dr. Jim, uh, not Dr. Jimmy Evans' Tipping Point podcast. whole lot of great stuff about the end times. And right now there's a lot of buzz everywhere. And it's fascinating. It, it, we should be having our heads lifted up and uh, looking for the return of Jesus. I think that's fascinating. Looking at the signs of the time, it's fascinating. But there's a lot going on there. My job as pastor, uh, I mean, I, I'm not as jazzed of trying to pick a day when Jesus is coming. And by the way, my endorsement of all of these men, it's strong. But pastor, are you saying you believe everything they believe? There's a whole bunch of just uh, sort of uh, prognosticating that it's not that I believe or disbelieve. I'm just kind of like, huh. That's my response to a lot of it. It's like, huh, that's an interesting take. If God would have wanted to make the return of Jesus crystal clear, he would have. And even Jesus, the disciple says, Jesus, give it to me straight. When are you coming back? And Jesus, the son of God said, I don't know. That's in God's hands. That's not for you to worry about. You guys go get filled with the Holy Spirit and get to work. So that's, that's a bit of my take here. I, I'm going to keep you aware when, I, when we see signs of the times coming. And we, we do actually spend at least usually one series a year talking about the end times. So I'm sorry to disappoint. I know some of you are like, all right, now we're going to get to the Antichrist and 666. And I know, and I'm so sorry to disappoint. But uh, I actually want to talk about, when I read through that, here's what I thought about when I was a kid, we talked about the rapture of the church. Now, that's, he talks about the rapture of the church. In, uh, what, what we, rapture, for those of you that were new to, new to faith, there's a place in uh, Thessalonians where it talks about there's a catching away, meeting Christ in the air. And it's, it's way beyond me explaining how's that going to happen. I don't know. That's what makes it a miracle. I just know this, that Jesus talked about he would return and we'd be caught up in the air. And uh, so when you're a seven or eight-year-old kid, I was raised in, in the, the church in the, the 60s and 70s. We talked about the rapture of the church. It was kind of put like a gun to your head, like, if you don't behave, Joe, Jesus is going to come back and you're going to be left. And, uh, man, when you're an eight-year-old kid, you're like, yeah, you know, 
And so, and, and, the, and the church culture I was raised in, we hadn't figured out grace yet. And so everything was, if you sin one time, you're not going to go. And if he comes back and you're in one of those dirty, filthy movie houses, you're sure not going to go. He doesn't go in there. And so I lived in fear that when I went to bed at night, I was going to wake up, my parents were going to be gone, and I knew my brother would probably be with me. But uh, <laughs> I like Larry. If I'm not going, he's not going. We'd be taking that second bus. But uh, anyway, when we talk about end time stuff, there's a certain fear that rises. And I lived in fear. I, I should have probably had counseling or drugs or meds or something just from the amount of PTSD of, of just worrying every day of my childhood up through my teens before I realized that uh, I, I'm actually not holding on to my salvation by, by my behavior. God is holding on to me. And I, I was told that if you sin once, you lose your salvation. But if you repent real quick, then you're back saved again. But if you cuss on the highway, oh, you're out again. And if he comes right then, sorry. But if you repent real quick, boom. Well, man, I was having to keep a list of stuff. It's like, which ones have I repented from? And every night and every morning, God forgive me, God forgive me. If I forgot anything, just please, just, you remember it. Just trying to not get left behind. I, I want to uh, I, I tell you, first of all, w- y- the Scripture tells us, we'll read it, you are, you are saved completely. When you come to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, and it's not a ginger flimsy thing. The blood of Jesus didn't barely save you. Like, oh, you're just a little better than you were. If the blood of bulls and goats could keep a Jewish guy saved, if you will, under the old covenant for a year, surely the blood of Jesus can do better than that. What I was raised in was, was not even as good as that. It was like, oh, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. Da, 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 da. So I'm going to help you. And I'm, I'm, if you say, Pastor, are you, are you for sinning? No, that's not what I'm saying. I am saying this, that the blood of Jesus keeps you. He ever lives to make intercession for you. So I want to actually deal with something we all deal with in Romans 8, and that is this, f- fear and doubt. I lived in fear and doubt. Every time you would talk about the return of Jesus, everybody in my church was like, hallelujah, yeah. And I was like, maybe, hallelujah, maybe. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be left and the, the Antichrist is going to brain six, six, six on my head. And then the only way to get free of that is to have your head cut off. I mean, I, <laughs> I, w- I lived in a lot of fear. And here was the fear. I'm not sure if I'm saved or not. I mean, it's all fun to talk about. If there wasn't some final accounting for your salvation, like you're, you're actually going to give an account. Daniel, we looked at that, the great white throne judgment. We all are going to give an account. Man, that causes you to, that's for real, and I can't take that pressure off of you. We all will give an account. When you know, you know, if you were going through college and you were taking, you were going to school, but there was never a test, you wouldn't pay much attention in class. If you were practicing football, but there was never a Friday night where you were going to play a game, you wouldn't practice with a lot of intentionality. God knows how we're built. We are all going to give an account for our life. That, that causes us to walk a certain way. That's a fantastic thing. But here's the thing. Uh, Jude tells us this. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling and to stand you holy and blameless in the presence of God. Jesus is, you can't in your straitjacket discipline stand yourself holy before God, but he can. So I want to I wanna talk about this, and let me bump this a little bit. I, I actually withdrew from a, a denomination uh, back when this church, when I first became the pastor of this church. Uh, one of the reasons was I, I wanted to ask questions to, in our group, uh, and, and I would talk to individual pastors and say, I, I, I want to talk about this particular doctrine. And they would say, well, I have the same questions you do, but you don't dare raise that in one of our meetings. You don't, you don't ask questions. And in, in, in the group I was in, you were sort of shamed if you had questions about theology, about God. For crying out loud, he's invisible. I mean, that's got to raise some questions. I can't see him. I can't hear him audibly. He's not writing it on the wall like he did for Daniel. I can't have a question. 
And there was a culture, and some of you have been raised in church cultures where it was a shame for you to have a doubt or a question. And so you come in here and you fake it. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. But when your head hits the pillow at night, you've got these, you've got these visitors, these doubts that are rising, but you feel like you, you, you should know better. Can I just rip the covers off of all of that? That's nonsense, guys. Man, Satan, his very first move, the very first words we hear from Satan after God spoke to Adam and Eve was this. Did God really say? Did God really say? What is that about? Man, that's immediate doubt. That's questioning. Yeah, I think. I mean, the first, I think he said that. Did, did God really say you were saved if you said the prayer? Well, I, I thought I said the prayer. Did I say the prayer wrong? All of a sudden, just with our basic salvation, we start to question. And if we don't understand how to answer those doubts, first of all, let me say this. There shouldn't be a safer place to ask questions than the church or your home. So any place that that shame thing of you should be more spiritual than that, you should just know that. Guys, that's a trap. Uh, break that stuff off and don't play that way. Just, just don't play that game. Go, no, I've got questions. And uh, man, if, if, if John the Baptist can doubt, you know, John the Baptist was there when Jesus was baptized and he heard God say, that is my boy and in him I'm well pleased. He heard it. He saw a dove descending. Like he baptized him. And about a year after that, when he was in prison, now tell me if this is not like life is, you have this enormous great experience. Man, I'm saved. I'm Holy Ghost filled. Man, halaba, halaba. Boom, boom. A year later, life goes bad. He's in prison. His cousin, Jesus, he thought was the Savior, but the Savior isn't saving him from jail. And he sends disciples to go, are you the one? Or should we be looking for another? Look, if John the Baptist gets to doubt, we certainly should. I mean, thank God for his call doubting Thomas. But look, it's just, it's, it's just it's built into. To, to, to have faith means you've got to have faith for something. So anyway, I just want to okay if you deal with doubts. If you're driving down the road and this thought comes to you, have I made all this up or? I want you to know that thought goes through my mind. That's probably not what you want to hear. But <laughs> this is the deal. That doesn't mean I think that. That means that, that gives my faith a chance to go, no, that, this is what I believe. And that's what faith is for. So I, I want to I share with you out of Romans chapter 8 that when you have feelings of doubt, feelings of I'm not even sure I'm saved, I want to I want to anger you. I want you to leave here angry. I want you to lay down on your horn when you come out of the park like I'm mad today. <laughs> Somebody's gonna get it. I want I want to fire you up so that I mean we're all happy when he, we're here in church. We're winners when we're here in church. The battles happen when you're alone, and you, you you I want you when when the alone thoughts come. You know how to respond to those things and go. I I'm not playing that. I know in whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded he's able. I, you, you're going to need some of this. So I want to fire you up, and I want to pull a scripture now out of Romans chapter 8. We're going to just dial into Romans chapter 8. But Romans chapter 8, verse 31, this sentence, what then shall we say in response to this? That's our message. What are you going to say in response to this? When doubt, when fear, when all of this shows up, the question is, what are you going to say to it? What shall we say to this? Uh, Station, I've been enjoying playing pickleball. And uh, in September, we started playing pickleball. So you got to get some pickleball stories here. Uh, we, we signed up for a tournament. She signed us up for a tournament. And uh, the advanced beginners, not just beginners, Advanced beginners, as I agree. Uh, our group played in this tournament. It would be. It was on a Sunday. Sunday's the worst day for me to play. I'm already. I'm tired. I'm after church. I'm used to taking that. Anyway, so we go to play the advanced beginners uh, pickleball, and when we get there, it was like Ma and Paul Kettle go to high school. I mean, <laughs> the, the closest competitors to us were 30 years our junior. And we're like, 
uh-oh, uh, hmm. And uh, so we come in on our walkers, you know, and putting our teeth in like, let's play some pickleball. We're ready. And uh, we do all right, man. We start batting it around. We got beat, but the team that actually won the thing, we, we got beat twice. They were, they were good, strong, young, all that. And uh, so we get down to the back end where we're actually still in it at the very end to play for third place. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get to first place, but third's good. We'll take third. So anyway, we're down to it. We got to win this game. And I, I, we watched the teams competing, and the team that we were going to end up playing, they were good. I mean, they were really good. And they had the young legs. They were both like 25-ish, all over the court, great placement and the whole thing. And honestly, in my mind, I mean, we both kind of had the, okay, you know what, it is what it is. I like, we, we're probably not going to win this thing. I mean, I, I really, I was out there to have fun until <laughs> it was all fun and games until we go up to the net to these 20-somethings, and they're precious, sweet. And uh, we go up to the net <laughs> to do the, hey, we're this. And uh, these two youngsters, they look at us. And they looked at each other and went, <laughs> and then they looked back at us and they did the, you're so cute. Well, I was willing to play sweet until you went and did that. You know what I'm saying? I turned and looked at, we were like, <laughs> we turned around and we did the, you know, you throw your paddle up like this and you act like you're saying something, whether you are or you're not, it looks intimidating to the other side. I usually ask Stacy what we're having for dinner or something, but anyway, it looks like, <laughs> we're walking back and it affected us, I think the same way, it was kind of like, did, did you just insult us? We, uh, willing to be nice. Man, it was on. And uh, it, it, this was what was happening inside of us. So what are you going to say in response to that? And the game was on. We, and we did. We, we, we got out on them like 7-0. We jumped on them. And I, I, I get a thing in my face when I'm like, oh, I ain't playing. I mean, if I have to fist fight you, go to jail. This is going down right here. And Stacy's a, she's a beast out there. Anyway, we beat those children so, I mean, we, it was like, <laughs> it's like, we were like up seven, eight to nothing. It's like, no mercy, no mercy. Stop on them. Break that little neck. That's just, you. man, we put them away. <laughs> Y'all go. It would probably been fine. But that little thing of, Wait a minute, what, what was that? What, what are you going to say to this? When doubt and fear and all these little whispers, you can't let that go. There's, there's folks in this room that you've been living, uh, and I'm not saying this as a shame thing. I'm saying as a this is your day to say, I've had it with this. I've had it with this. I'm not going to live just because I don't feel loved of God has nothing to do with what's true. Just because our culture has exalted how you feel above what is true, we don't buy into that. We're from a kingdom. I, I don't buy that nonsense, and neither do you. And sometimes you've got to go a little Medea on your feelings and kind of have something rev up to go, I ain't playing this. Now this I'm not letting it slide. Are y'all tracking with I'm not going to let this slide. And this is one of those. Now, there's some folks watching me online. You hear me. Right, you know, the word at the, at the front of the year, and I, I tried to rev up a word like, we'll have more in 24 and all that. I couldn't find any cute sayings. My time of prayer, Pastor Glenn, was, you know what, we need to be strong because it's going to be a tough year. And my job is to prepare you. I mean, when we're fighting together, we're going to win. The, the, the devil isn't going to attack in here. You've got no chance. He's going to catch you out by yourself and start dropping little thoughts and find places where you're hurt and find entry points. And he's messing with everybody. And you've got to know how to answer. You've got to have a little bit of that. Then what are you going to, are you going to let that stand or are you going to speak back to it? Life and death are in the power 
of the tongue. And there are some feelings to just ignore, but there's some that you need to speak to and go, no, that's not how it's going to be. I'm going to speak with the word of God. Eve was tempted. Jesus, his first temptation, you are my son in whom I'm well pleased. The first thing Satan did is say, if you're the son of God, if you're the son. And you know what? Jesus said, I'm not letting that. What do you mean if? God just said it. And he said, well, if you're the son of God, do something impressive. Do a miracle. And Jesus said, well, I could do it. But doing a miracle doesn't prove you're trying to get me to, you know, here's what Satan does. Well, if you're a Christian, do something. Do something spectacular. Let's see your Christian stuff. And tries to get you dancing like, you know, if you start performing to try to act like you're a Christian, you'll act the rest of your life. Jesus said, I could turn those stones into Big Macs, but I'm not going to because I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have to perform and prove I'm who God says I am. I live by every word that comes out of his mouth because he said it. That settles it. And he answered those doubts with this is what God has said, now back off. Satan then said, well, if you're the son of God again, then God should do something spectacular for you. Jump off the building and have him catch you. You're out here starving. That, you don't look like somebody God loves. God should do something spectacular. And again, Jesus didn't buy the bait. You're saved because you said, you said yes to God and the word of God says. Your feelings don't get to input it. Your circumstances don't get a voice in this. How bad things are, how good things are. Nothing gets a voice but the word of God. And you've got to be able to, when, when we answer this question, what shall we say in response to these things then? And Paul goes on, if God is for me, then it doesn't matter what's against me. We answer with the word of God. So I want to help you process some doubt. Man, I feel like I'm, I feel like I got some parents here wrestling. Uh, let me hit it while I'm here. It is not unusual to raise a child through, you know, in church and them see your faith and then they hit some little wild patch and begin to ask hard questions and scare you to death. I'm not sure I believe in this and I'm not sure I believe in that. Moms and dads, don't you panic. Don't you panic. The, 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 what they need to work that out. I mean, you start thinking, oh, what do we do wrong? I thought I raised them better than that. This, this, and this. And I get all that. I did that too. <laughs> but here's the thing. What they're, what they're really trying to work out is, look, I've seen your faith. Yeah, can, can I make it my faith? You know how you make, faith has to face something that pushes against it. And it's not, it's probably not going to be pretty. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, let's bring him up and have the pastor pray for him. It'll be all okay. He'll fall out and blah, blah, blah. No, it's probably, it could be two or three or four years of hell on earth. Them getting crazy on you and stuff. Listen, is that me? Uh, I'm, I'm grab up. Yeah, there you go. Bring it. What a friend you have been. All right, we're getting loaded up back there. Let's give Phil a hand. Phil's looking all handsome. I'll tell you what, let me keep teaching here. Y'all get it together. All right. First question is this. What will we say in response to condemnation? What will we say in response to condemnation? All right, thank you. I'll keep it in case, in case I need it. Uh, what is condemnation? Well, condemnation. This is Roman. Now, we're, we're going to go through Romans 8, and Romans 8 is one of my favorite fishing holes. And I will encourage you, if you don't have four or five great fishing holes in the Bible, Romans 8 should be maybe one of your first ones. You just, you just, fishing holes meaning every time I go and read it, I catch something. So that's a good fishing hole. Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, if you're saved. Who do not walk according to the flesh. In other words, God's not keeping score about his acceptance and love for you anymore according to your behavior. Behavior matters, but that's not what's determining your, your acceptance and your forgiveness. You're not walking any longer according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through this flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement 
of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Okay, what does all of that mean? First of all, what is condemnation? Condemnation usually is that feeling that rises up in us when we've failed or sinned. And again, I'll just tell you, there's some mornings I feel condemned, just, just feel like, God, do you love me? Have you forgiven? I feel it. I don't say it. I feel it. Uh, th- four out of, five out of seven days a week, I don't feel saved. And there's a susceptibility if you don't know how to work against these doubts, this condemnation. It's a sense of, God, I know you've saved everybody else. It just seems like there's something uniquely flawed about me that I'm just not in with you. And that thing will gnaw on you until you tell it differently. It'll gnaw on you. And if, and if you're trying to make sure you're saved, it pretty much keeps you. It's not that you're totally worthless for the rest of the kingdom call on your life. But honestly, you're not terribly interested in trying to get anybody else saved because you don't want them to come in and suffer what you're suffering like. I think I'm losing my mind. I have a boatload of guilt and all I can do is self-condemn. Gang, that's not what Jesus died for. All right, you can take it out. Two, 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 two. That's not what Jesus died for. Jesus died to save you completely. Here's what this says. There's therefore now no condemnation for you who are in Christ. You don't have to put up with that. That's the feeling of condemnation. What is condemnation? If you're condemned, if you come before the court and you've been accused of something and uh, the judge gavels down, to condemn you would be this. You're guilty. There is no hope for you. You're condemned to death. In other words, your life doesn't need to be here, and it's irredeemable, condemned, pow. You're not condemned. Condemned in uh, architecture, buildings. If a, a, an inspector comes to a building and looks at a building and says, this building's condemned, it means it's uninhabitable, and there's no hope to actually restore it. What the Scripture's telling us is that there's therefore now no condemnation for you. In, in other words, You are never, once you've said yes to Jesus, there is no possibility that God would say over you, you're not inhabitable and you're not not redeemable and you can't be restored. The Holy Spirit comes to inhabit you. And that's settled and it's done. And the fact that feelings come to say, is he really inhabiting you? I mean, are, are you feeling the Holy Ghost? You go, no, no, I don't really feel him today. You don't feel the Holy Spirit most of the time. Most of the time, you don't, I'm, I mean, I, want, I love the worship times and I love the ooey gooey's and all of that. And sometimes I'm just having private times with the Lord and I'm thinking, oh, Lord, I just feel you. Most of the time, I don't. Does that mean he's gone somewhere? Just my feelings. Man, and then we have this scripture. That's why we don't count on our feelings. The scripture says this, we're no longer living according to our flesh. In other words, before Jesus God was looking at you and saying, if you sin, you're out. That's the law of sin and die. You sin, you're out. Go kill some lambs. Go kill some, some goats or something. Come back in. But once, one strike, you're out. You sin, you're out. I was raised in a church culture that basically said, one sin, you're out. Repent, you're back in. I was raised under the law. Man, when, when somebody first taught grace to me, I was like, you have got to be kidding. You've got to be. You mean I am, I don't, it's not that I, and for sinning, I, it's just that I don't have to keep record of all of those sins. I'm, here's the thing. I'm, I'm relieved of the law of sin and die because it's no longer about the performance of my flesh. When I received Jesus, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of me. Hebrews says, we've joined the spirits of the righteous made perfect. My spirit became perfect, and when God looks at me, he's not judging me by how good a day I'm having, how bad a day I'm having. Got out there in traffic. I was holy for like three days, and then some Jake leg pulled in front of me, and I said something went, oh. And God was like, oh, Harvey, I'm just, what am I going to do for you? He's not looking at my minute-to-minute behavior. He looks at the spirit. I'm under a new law, a new governance. He looks and says, there's my spirit. He's in Randy Harvey right there. That settles it. There's therefore now no condemnation. I'm under a new law, and it's a higher law. If you've not received Jesus, you're still under the old law. You will pay the price for your sin. In other words, you're going to stand before God and say, look, I don't need you, Jesus, to pay my bill. I'll pay my own bill. What do I owe? And they're going to look at your record, and you'll have to give an account for your record. 
You'll be judged that way. But if you've received Jesus, he's not going to look at your record of rights and wrongs. He no longer counts your sins against you. He just says, you have my spirit, you're mine, come on in. That's how that works. Yeah, praise God for that. You are not uninhabitable. You're not uninhabitable and you're not unredeemable. And anytime you feel like that, here's the question. What are you going to say to that? Everybody here is going to feel it. Save two or three just super righteous KGO veterans. Other than you three, everybody in here is going to at some point have those creepy feelings. And some of us, like me, have to deal with them all the time. I was raised in that culture. So for whatever reason, it's very natural. You know what? I just don't play anymore. I still play. How am I going to respond to it? I respond to it just like this. And I run up and down here and say, there is therefore now no condemnation for me who is in Christ Jesus because I'm no longer under the law of sin and death. I'm under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And I have the spirit of life living in me. Case closed. At just case closed. You've been bought with a price. In other words, you, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He has inhabited you. You're bought with a price. You don't even own you. So you are not only inhabited, but he inhabits and then begins reconstruction immediately upon taking residence. Have you noticed? Again, the original Chip and Joe, Holy Spirit comes in and starts renovating immediately your life. That's good news. When those feelings come, you quote this scripture right here. That's who you send to the door. There's therefore now no condemnation. Are y'all tracking with me? That's how you respond to that. Secondly, how do we respond to personal weaknesses? Personal weaknesses. Everybody in here has something. Everybody starts looking around. I want to say this. Like, yeah, he's talking. To, I wish Bob was here because Bob's got some weaknesses. And, uh, Pastor Randy's got weaknesses. Everybody in here has areas. Uh, man, there's 25 things that you could you know, list off and I'd go, I'm golden. I'm, I'm killing it. I, but you could hit one or two and I'd go, ooh, those are rough areas for me. When we have weaknesses in our life, you know that, that Paul had a weakness and he said, man, I've been praying, God, would you take this away? It was called a buffeting spirit. And he said, this buffeting spirit was given me and I'm thinking, God, all these other areas, I'm golden, but I've got this one thing. Some think it was a physical ailment. We don't know. I'm glad we don't know because it helps us all to know whatever yours is, that's it. It's a thorn in the flesh, and everybody has something where you go, man, I just keep being tempted here, or I failed here, or I said it again, or whatever. And it's the kind of thing, once again, that leaves opportunity for the, for the enemy or just your own doubt. Sometimes the devil doesn't get involved. Look, I was so self-condemning for so many years, the devil took a vacation. You know, I was like, I could beat myself up more than any demon he could send. And I thought it was holy. I thought, this is righteous. I'm so humble. No, it was dumb. It was not being uh, educated to know, man, I am saved. I, I couldn't get to hell if I tried. How's that for some confidence? I know some of you just got rattled in your religiousness to go, hey, wait a minute. You got to be real careful. You know what? I've been careful for 60 some odd years, and I'm still careful. But here's what I know. I am not holding on to my salvation. It's holding on to me. <laughs> and the Spirit of God has taken possession of me. And I want to show you here when you're dealing with weaknesses. Uh, let's look here. This is Romans 8, 26. You have the Holy Spirit of God. In the same way, the Holy Spirit helps our what? Our weaknesses. He helps our weaknesses. Not just weakness in prayer, but when we do not know how to, to pray as we ought, for the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches the heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according uh, with God's will, in accordance with God's will. Now, I know all of us, and there's many of us that have grown up charismatic or Pentecostal or whatever I was raised in, that, and I appreciate that, that we do sometimes use this scripture to say this is what praying in the Spirit is. It's the Holy Spirit when, when we don't have words or can't think of what to pray or don't know how to pray. He prays through us. And, and yes, that, that's true. That's a way. But gang, broaden out. The Holy Spirit, he's not just praying for you. Intercession does not mean that the Holy Spirit's before God right now while you're sitting here going, Harvey is such a knucklehead. 
We both know it. I've known it for years. You too, God. And I, I just don't know what to do with it. Could you please help him? That's not what the Holy Spirit is doing. Intercession, guys, if, if you're drowning in a pool, the lifeguard intercedes for you. He doesn't come to the edge of the pool and say, make positive confessions. Just confess it. It's not happening. Just say, this is not wet and I'm not drowning. Hallelujah. Just say that. Oh, Lord, help him not to drown. Oh, it's looking awful out there. Just confess. Confess Isaiah there. When you go through the waters, won't be fire, you won't be burned. When you go through the waters, you won't drown. Just say that. Just confess. That's not what he's doing. He, he dives in, and my brother was a lifeguard, and he used to, big old Larry, and he used to love, love to tell me that when they train you, if the person that, that's fighting, if they fight you, knock them out. Punch them in the mouth. Knock them out so you can get them to safety. Intercession isn't just the Holy Spirit going, oh, Lord, please help him. He's crazy. The Holy, the Holy Spirit is God Almighty. He is God the Holy Spirit. He's the enforcer. He's the enforcer of the will of God. He's aligning us with the will of God. Let me read the rest of this, and it will make some sense to you as to what the work of the Holy Spirit is. Many of you have this verse on your refrigerator. It says, and we know that all things work together for the good for those who love God, who have been called according to his purpose. That's a wonderful scripture. Does it just happen? Does that just happen? And we know God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. Is it just, just a floating scripture? Is that working for you? Gang, it happens because of the previous verse, because the Holy Spirit knows how to make things work together, and he's not just praying for you. He's interceding. If you need saving, he saves. Uh, if, if there's a bully fighting you, my brother also was a, a big bully, and uh, nobody touched Randy Harvey in high school, not because they didn't want to or because I didn't probably deserve it, but my brother was bigger than everybody, and they knew my brother would intercede and go, you better back it down. The Holy Spirit in intercession is not just praying. He is bringing things in accordance to the will of God. He, again, he's the enforcer. And it's, it's harder to get out of line than you think. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you with this in just a second. Uh, for those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. In other words, made them to look like Jesus. You are justified. And whom he justified, he glorified. There's a lot of cool stuff right there. And every person who's received Jesus has now been given a predestination to look like Jesus. Right? So most of us read that and we think, oh, I've got to work harder. I've got to read my Bible. I've got to pray. I've got to fast. Oh, I hate fasting. I've got I to I be like Jesus. I mean, have at it. And I did it for years. You're going to look about that much more like Jesus by your straitjacket disciplines. You can't look like Jesus if you try. Without the Holy Spirit directing this, he's, 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 and he's not just praying for you, and he's not just praying in tongues through you. He's got a whole lot of authority over the house that he lives in, and he's moving it forward. Yes, you can cooperate or not cooperate. That's true. You can drag this out. I mean, the Holy Spirit comes and say, look, we can do this the easy way or we can do it the hard way. It's up to you. But we're going to get it done. It's going to happen. You're going to look like Jesus because I bought you. You don't own the deed to this thing. We're going to get this done. So you've been predestined to look like Jesus. This is good news. It's good to know that, that salvation isn't some flimsy something. That God was like, no, I know what I'm doing. And some of y'all are going to take a lot of work. And I know, I know what I'm getting into. Some of y'all are a messy job, but we're going to get the job done. All right. Be encouraged. You're predestined to look like Jesus, whom he called, whom he predestined, he called. In other words, the call of God on your life. The Holy Spirit knows that's the will of God, so he's determined to get it done. Kicking and screaming. Or, or we can do it the easy way. Just submit. <laughs> whom he called, he justified. You're justified. He convinces you that you're more righteous than you think you are. He convicts the world of sin so that we can get saved. Convicts us of righteousness. What does that mean? It actually means convinces you. You're right with God. Come on, let's get on with it. And that the world is defeated. Gang, when I was um, about 25 years old, and this is when Glenn and I knew each other first. I, 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 you know, every prophet that got around said, you're going to pastor, you're going to be a pastor. Stacey will tell you. Glenn, I can't tell you. Not only did I not want to be pastor, 
I aggressively despised the idea of being a pastor. I mean, it's one thing to not want it. It's another thing to go, I mean, I was like full-on Jonah. Like, let the Ninevites fend for themselves. I'm going this way. And I meant it. I just, the idea of, of pastor as a career, I thought, oh, that's awful. I'm going to starve to death and be poor and, you know, two hubcaps be gone all the time, four different... It's like, this is awful. And uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be like Lauren. I'm going to be a pilot. That's what I thought. That's a respectable career. And uh, fly airplanes and, you know, wear the uniform and have the hot wife and all that, just uh, which I already got. I got that. And I'm uh, smoking one. But it, it, money, vacations and retirement and, man. And, uh, gang, I tried. I, try, I left ministry, uh, Glenn, it, two and a half years of misery. And every door, I tr- nothing would, oh, here's the thing. <laughs> I'm just going to shoot straight with him. Make it, I'm going to help you, some of you young people. Just go with whatever God's called you to do. Because he will shut doors that you can't get open. And he will open doors that won't shut. And every door I tried to go through was just like, pow. And not just like pap, it was like pow. And there's scripture in Hebrews 12 that talks about the discipline of the Lord, and we think of being spanked or whatever there. It's, it's the power of a father to take your life, and he's not waiting on you to mess it up. A good father will say, look here, Joe, we're not going to do this, and we are going to do that. Do you understand me? He, my, dad, my dad asked me very, I don't think he ever asked me a question. Would you like to do this? Son? My dad didn't ever he was Warden L.D. Harvey. And my opinion wasn't even, it's like, this is what you're going to do. We're doing it. Get on with it. And uh, now I thought he was rough, but the truth is, my earthly dad, but more than that, my heavenly father and the Holy Spirit knew how to close doors so that I would come back. It says here he prays the very, he knows what the will of the father is. He's not trying to figure that out. He knows it. And when he gets you as an assignment, it's just best to surrender and go with it. Two and a half years of misery. Right now, I drive to work, and I, I can't tell you how many times I've said, God, thank you that you didn't let me go my way. Thank you that you were relentless. I tried to mess this up, and I really thought I knew best, but you wouldn't let me because you, you are God, the Holy Spirit. You were interceding when I, when I didn't even like that you were interceding. You knew what I would be happy with, what would bring me joy, what would bring you joy. And you wouldn't let me out of your grip. I'm now at 61. I was young, but now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I can tell you, I look back and go, thank you, God. Thank you, God. I was made for this. I just couldn't see it. But you could. And you loved me enough to shut and open doors. The Holy Spirit, yes, find some security in our God. You're not just out here. He's like really sensitive. I mean, you just say something, poof, there he goes. There he goes. Man, sensitive, uh, thin-skinned, American, charismatic. He is like a dove. And I've told this story. I wanted to release doves during the wedding. And so figuring out five times. And I said, so, uh, you, you're going to do? She said, <laughs> from. And uh, she said, this, this, is, this is, she said, reverend, you know, dove know exactly where the home. I, I do weddings spirit like a dove. He knows the will of God, which is home. And he's not nearly as sensitive or easy to push away as we've made him. He's God Almighty, the enforcer of the will of God. The very best thing you can do today is say, Lord, first I receive you as my Savior, and secondly, come take resident and have your way. Do with me. Get me home. You know where I'm going. I do not. How do you answer those weaknesses? You say, Holy, the Holy Spirit is my intercessor. Ho- he is holy through me. He is making me holy. I am not perfect yet. There's always a gap between my spirit's desire to please God. This is Matthew 7. No time to get into, I mean, uh, Romans 7. Paul basically said there's a gap between what my heart wants to do. I want to please God. Everything in me wants to please God. But in my flesh, sometimes I do things I shouldn't do and don't do things I should do. 
And gang, hear me. This is not abnormal. This isn't bad Christianity. This is normal Christianity. Your spirit's desire and your flesh's capacity, there's always going to be some gap between those. You track them with me? I want to please you, but oh, I blew it. Some of you are going, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of us do because we blow it. I blew it, I blew it yesterday. Uh, I was up here early in the morning. We had 50 teenagers here all night long for a lock-in. And, uh, and I was in, man, they were everywhere. I don't know, the music was thumping. Man, they were, they were having a time, and I'm up here to be holy. So um, I'm going to get my coffee and high-fiving a few of them. And uh, one precious little girl was a little bit by herself in the group. And I had that little thing on the inside. You know what I'm saying? That little bump like, no, I, I said hello to her, but that's all I did. I, I got here this morning. And, I, and I, here's the thing. The Holy Spirit doesn't holler at you. <laughs> but, when you but when he says something and you miss it, oh, it's awfully loud afterwards. Man, I came up here this morning to start to pray, and all I could see was this little girl's face who needed her pastor to just take a second, pay attention, listen to my heart, just let me know you've noticed me. Man, and that opportunity came that fast, and it went that fast. And I came up here this morning, and that's the first thing I said is, Lord, I missed it. My heart... My, the, the, the spirit inside me reached to do the right thing. My, well, I'm a busy pastor. I've got to go be holy. Dumb. First thing I did was the Holy Spirit raised that. I said, Lord, I'm sorry. You know what? She came up to me after the first service, got to hug her and apologize. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Gang, I wish I could say that happens to me once every six months. <sighs> Man, this is pretty much normal life. Things I ought to do, I, I, sometimes I don't. Things I shouldn't do, sometimes I do. But the whole, my, but praise God, the spirit I keep, here's what Paul said. Guys, I hadn't, I'm not perfect yet. After 30 years, he wrote that, by the way. 30 years. He's built churches and written the gospels. And after 30 years, he says, guys, I'm writing actually way out in front of where I'm actually living. There's a gap between where my spirit is longing to be and my flesh catching up. That gap is an opportunity for doubt and condemnation. Guys, if you know this is normal and you know it's coming, you won't overreact and go, oh, I'm such a terrible person. Am I even saved? You will respond to it like, you know what? That might be true, but I am a child of God. There is therefore now no condemnation. And the beauty of grace is, yes, I may fall, but I get to get back up. And, gang, you don't need to beat yourself up for three days. Get back up, put your helmet on, get out there on the field and hit somebody. Get back in the game. <laughs> Praise God this morning. I, you know, I could either have resigned the church because I missed it. Or it's like, you know what? No. Uh, Praise God. The Holy Spirit's here interceding for me. There's going to be a bunch of other opportunities for me, and I'm just going to keep on going. Now, I wish I could say it was prettier than what I just described. This is pretty much, I think this pretty good Christian living. You're going to hit some and miss some. That sounds like a cop I'm not saying sin just to sin. I'm just saying your spirit's going to be a few steps ahead of your flesh's compliance. And you're going to always be working on it. And the two of those things are always going to be at war. That's the Bible. Galatians and Romans, but they're at war. Don't overreact to that like you're a terrible person. Send something to the door. Send the Holy Spirit to the door. Holy Spirit, would you answer that? Would you just go tell that condemnation? Would you strengthen me for what I need today? Hallelujah. Uh, I got way more message than we got time. What will we say in response to accusations, Romans 8, 34? Who will bring a charge against those whom God has chosen? What are you going to say to that? Here's what you answer. It's God who justifies. It's God who, I don't justify myself. Who is the one that condemns? What do you answer to that? Christ Jesus who died. More than that was raised to life. Is at the right hand of the Father. He is also interceding for me. He isn't, the God, the Holy Spirit is interceding for you. And I described intercession. Jesus ever lives to make intercession for you. He's interceding. No, he's not going to, oh, please, Father, please. That, he's not, he's, inter, he's doing, he's using all of heaven's authority and power to see to it that you're aligned with his will. 
and we're all kind of little knuckleheads. Pastor, what if I make a mistake? What if I don't do the perfect will of God? Some of you are in the trap of, if I make one mistake, I'm going to blow the will of God. Don't be insulted by what I'm going to say. Stupid is built into the plan. There's a little give on each side. You know what I'm saying? It's like when you're, there, there's going to be cost overruns, we already know. And some of us maybe a, a little more. The Holy Spirit's not going, God, I didn't see that one coming. I can't fix that. You've messed this up. You, you're not in the perfect will of God. You know what? He's the only one that knows that. Guys, you're not holding on to God. He's holding on to you. And we're not out here fighting an enemy just we, 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 if God is actually for us, and he is, it doesn't matter what's against us. You're in the position of strength. We're just, we've somehow been convinced we're not. And I'm trying to tell you, not just when we're in church and we're all rah-rah, but when you're by yourself, something needs to rise up to go, yeah, I am not putting it up with these emotions, with these suggestions, whether they're the devil or my mother-in-law or myself. I, I'm not putting, I'm not saying go and fight your mother-in-law. I, t- scratch that. That was bad. <laughs> Take that one off. Don't go fight people. But don't let things just sit there and assume they're right because you feel it. What are you going to say to these things in response? No, again, look, Holy Ghost Medea, you, you say something. Don't let it sit there. Oh, my goodness. Okay, last one. In response to perilous circumstances, some people have um, horrible things happen. Bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. And, and it's a natural thing to go, man, if God loved me, why is this happening to me? And Paul, Paul deals with that because you're going to feel that. If God loved me, things would be better. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Uh, this is verse 35 of 8. Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, Famine, nakedness, not being able to afford clothes, danger or sword, which means death. Man, that's a lot of bad stuff that can happen. And all of those things have a message in them. God's not paying attention to you. God's not watching out of you. Man, it's been three months and you hadn't been able to pay your bills. You had somebody, you know, I had my, my sister died at 33 years old. Man, I had to wrestle that through. Man, you had that. If God loved you, would that have happened? Would that have happened? And here's what Paul's saying. God's love is so Above those things, yes, you become susceptible to that suggestion. If God loved you, this wouldn't be happening. When that happens, you send this to the door. No, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, which covers just about everything, neither angels nor demons, neither the things present or anything that can happen in the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He loves you more than you love you. When you said yes to him, he got his hand on you. You are in his hand. He seals you with the Holy Spirit, and he is for you. He is for you. Yes, there are things against you. If you know you can answer the door and you don't have to put up with it, you're going to fight far more victoriously. And I'm wanting to speak to everybody that's, that's kind of been sitting out the fight. You've just been kind of putting up with it because, oh, I feel this or I feel that. I feel all kinds of things. As an individual warrior, I just want to tell you, the way to fight that battle is you don't let those feelings determine what's true. They're feelings. You respond to them by the word of God and Get a little hacked off because some of you have lived a whole lot. You've wasted a whole lot of life. I don't mean this shamingly. I mean, get angry that you've, you've had so much life stolen from you because you didn't know you didn't have to put up with it. You have authority. So what will you say in response to these things? You're going to say something. I'm not putting up with it because the truth says I don't have to. Amen. Amen. Stand to your feet. Prayer teams to the front. Always know this. Your salvation will get questioned. Your calling will get questioned. That's not abnormal. That's normal. Prayer teams to the front. Let me pray over you. How many of you saw the Super Bowl last week? I'm sorry, Joe. I'm praying for you. Christian McCaffrey, uh, running back. He's a great running back. I'll tell you why. A little football talk, and then I'll let you go. 
Earl Campbell, all these guys. A great running back, when he gets the football, he won't go down with the first contact. There's a bunch of running backs that you're never going to know their names because the first guy that hits them in the backfield, their first contact, they just drop and go down. You'll never know their names unless you're a Cowboy fan. But <laughs> Now, this is what, when you watch Christian McCaffrey last week, and I, God can speak to you while you're watching the Super Bowl. Man, the first guy to hit him, he would take that contact and keep on running. He, bounce off of it. Another one, another one. It takes six or eight guys to get that guy on the ground. Earl Campbell, even something beyond that. Earl was something. Gang, here's, here's what I want you to know. Biblically, both in Genesis and with Jesus, first contact, first contact that's going to come to you is Satan getting you to doubt. That's the first contact. If you fall there, you're pretty much done. You're built to endure that first hit and keep on running. You, you have to respond to it, though. You have to respond. Don't you go down with that football. Football means you got saved, and now you're running your, your race. The first thing that's going to hit you is doubt, and you're going to have to learn to respond to it. And you can't come running to the pastor. Just come to church, and you don't have to fake it. All right, I've preached enough. Let's pray, and then uh, if you need prayer, we'll, we'll bring you up here. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for every person in here that your spirit is moving and you are speaking to us. Right now, if you do not know Jesus, then there's nothing that I've said that actually applies to you, but it could if you'll receive Jesus as your Savior. This is no flimsy thing and no light decision. This is you opening up to the true owner of your life. Jesus' blood purchased our lives, and he's actually the rightful owner. When you surrender and say, God, take my life, he takes you, and the Holy Spirit comes to bring you home. You're an orphan at heart, and there's a holy homesickness that says, I've got to find my dad. I can't seem to find it. That's that emptiness. And today, the way you get that filled is by receiving Jesus as your Savior and surrendering your life to him, the rightful owner to your life. If that's you and you already know something's burning in your heart, re repeat this prayer and mean it. Let's all pray it together. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner and I've sinned against you and I'm fully responsible. Please forgive me. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He lived for me. He bled for me and he died for me to pay for my sins to pay my debt, to pay my bill. I believe you raised him from the dead. And I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior, my intercessor, my Lord. I surrender my life to you. Do anything you want with my life. I'm all yours. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. If you just prayed that prayer in a minute, your life is different from this day forward. The Holy Spirit has taken up residence, and you'll begin to find some of the things we've talked about. I will say this. Come to church. Come to church. Let us help you walk with it. All right, Pastor Reggie. All right. Let's, <laughs> let's give God praise for that message that he gave our pastor. Amen. That was so, so so good. You know, we see Jesus saying in Scripture, because of unbelief and doubt, things can't happen. And so now we're armed and dangerous. And we need to be dangerous because the world needs us. We are the plan. We are the plan. Amen? All right. Um, if you accepted Jesus for the first time, Here's a Connect card. What I'd like you to do is fill it out and take it to the Connect desk that's in the foyer. If you have prayer requests, fill it out, and we will call you because we want to come alongside you. You've already heard that we've got an event this weekend, the men's breakfast, 8 o'clock, and we've got the next steps. Both of those events you can register for online. 
Now, our final act of worship is our tithes and offerings. And we know that God has said that he would supply our every need. Does everybody understand what every means? Every need. And so what I'd like to do is pray over your tithes and offerings, and you can give them in the white boxes in the back of the room, or there's some text up on the screen. So, Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we are so grateful and thankful that you give us our daily bread. And out of our gratitude and thankfulness, we return part of that to you. Father, we thank you that you have blessed every household in this place, the households that are listening online, because you care about every detail of our life. So, Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son and you've promised to meet our every need. And so, in Jesus' name, the entire church said, amen, amen. So, life group launch outside. These people up here want to pray with you. If you've had a doubt, if you've had a, a place of unbelief, come up here and let them agree with you because there's power in agreement. Some of you are a prayer away from turning something around in your life because God watches over his word to perform it. So have an amazing day. Come up front for prayer and enjoy yourself out front. Amen?